Gospel of the Pantheon, Chapter 2, The Beholder. Chapter 2, The Beholder, Verse 1. Five years after the death of the god of time, the Beholder was born to a happy couple in France. I don't know what their names were. The man and the woman were artists, and they lived a fine life of parties and good work. The couple got along swimmingly and agreed on most things, but they agreed most forcefully about one thing in particular. Neither wanted to have a child. They wanted so badly not to bear offspring, in fact, that the male of the pair usually wore the only prophylactic available at the time during copulation. It was made out of sweet gum and well-worked lamb's hide, and it diminished the pleasure of the experience significantly. So, despite the strong feelings the two shared on this subject of procreation, there came a day when passion outgunned preventative diligence, and not long after, the woman woefully informed her husband that she was pregnant. Much tear-making and beating of brows followed, but the couple eventually resigned themselves to their fate and prepared the spare room as a nursery. The daughter who emerged from the woman looked nothing like any other child anyone in the village had ever seen. Most modern persons would immediately identify the child as a girl of Chinese descent, but in the French village where she was born, nobody had any idea what Chinese people looked like. The good news was that the, giant, the girl looked so utterly unrelated to either of her parents, indeed so unrelated to any human being that anyone in the village had ever seen, that no one suspected adultery. The man and his wife were famously devoted to one another, and the notion the child was conceived out of wedlock strained all credibility to the point where it was never seriously considered by the man, the bin wife, or any of the neighbors. The girl's odd appearance was a topic of conversation for a while, of course, but soon enough the village became accustomed to it, and it ceased to, to be interesting. The parents, being parents, could not help but love their daughter immensely once they got to know her a bit, and soon they laughed at the former dread of childbearing. They could not imagine life without this little girl. As the child aged and required less constant care, the couple resumed their artistic endeavors, and their life became just as busy and productive as it had been, but was much richer thanks to the addition of the little Chinese child, whom they had named Marie. When Marie became old enough to grasp objects and follow instructions, the couple endeavored to teach her art making. It was their passion, and like any parents, they wished to impress their values upon their child. The wife began by giving her daughter some finger paints and demonstrating how one might use them to create an artwork. She encouraged her daughter to do likewise. The daughter, however, would have none of it. Much to the surprise and dismay of her parents, Marie was not merely disinterested in painting, she flatly refused to make even the smallest mark upon the canvas. As the years passed, the couple tried desperately to interest their daughter in every medium of art they could think of. She would engage in none. She would not carve nor mold clay, nor sketch even the simplest stick figure. The only writing that she was willing to even attempt was of a relentlessly practical variety. I have gone to market to get bread, for example. The girl refused to try acting or whittling sticks, or even to make a simple rhyme. This sorely disappointed the couple. But still, they loved their daughter, and so eventually they shrugged their collective shoulders and gave up and focused on other kinds of parenting, and upon their own artistic endeavors, of course. One day, when the girl was about seven or eight years old, the mother brought a painting that she had just completed in from the studio to the kitchen where she expected to find her husband. She wanted his opinion about it. She found Marie instead, dipping some bread into milk and eating it. "'Isn't your father here with you, Marie?' the mother asked in a French accent. <laughs> "'No, Mama. He just left. He said he needed to ride to the apothecary for more alum, and he said he would bring it back... He would bring back some licorice for me as well. Ah, said the mother, disappointed. Well, I was hoping to get his opinion on my painting, but no matter. The mother, having long since concluded that her daughter had no interest in art, had never bothered to ask her daughter's opinion about any work that she had completed, and her daughter had never volunteered any opinion whatsoever. But on this day, the mother was quite excited by her new work and had anticipated that her trip to the kitchen would produce feedback. So on a whim, she asked, Marie, what do you think of Mama's painting? Do you like it? Marie turned and looked at the work. She stared at it intently for a few moments. Then she got up and moved to look at it up close. Then she stepped back and looked at it from far away. At last, she spoke. The two figures on the right constitute the inspired work. However, there are problems with the composition of the large work as a whole. The table and chair to the left are rendered rather clumsily and tacked on just to fill space. I recommend cutting the canvas there at the edge of the table all the way down vertically. Frame just the two figures in the, in the dark wood. A thin, simple frame to make a uh, long, narrow painting that gives the impression of tapestry scaled down. That, I think, would make for a skillful final piece. And then the girl sat that back down and resumed dipping bread into milk and eating it. What? said the mother dumbly. The girl simply chewed her bread and looked at her mother. Eventually, she said, I hope Papa does not forget the licorice. The woman, bewildered, excused herself and returned with the poop painting to the studio. She looked at the work and saw now that her daughter had been precisely perfectly correct. 
every word had been right on the money, but it made no sense at all. The girl had not expressed even the slightest interest in any sort of art whatsoever. By the time her husband had returned home, the wife had almost convinced herself that the whole experience had never happened. She related the story to her husband, nevertheless, as it was far too remarkable not to mention, even if it had been some figment of her imagination. The husband was incredulous. But what were her exact words, dear? Surely Marie did not use that sort of language. I assure you she did, or at least that is what I thought I heard from her, as clearly as I think I'm talking to you now. The husband went to his workspace and brought out a nearly complete bust that he had been laboriously sculpting out of marble. It was a piece that had been commissioned by a local wealthy merchant, and while the artist was happy to have paying work, the goal of the piece was more flattery than anything else. Marie, the father asked, placing the bust upon the kitchen table, can you come in here for a moment, please? Yes, Papa. What do you think of Daddy's sculpture, eh? The girl looked at it for a bit, but she took less time perusing it than she had her mother's painting. Then she politely finished chewing the piece of licorice and swallowed it before speaking, as Marie was a good girl who cared very much about her manners. I'd say it's essentially crap. I don't think there was ever any sort of inspiration in this at all. I recommend you scrap it and start over. Everything about it feels workmanlike and forced. True, it shows some skilled craftsmanship and attention, but this is bad art. Then she returned to her room where she was reading a book about a milkmaid who falls in the well. The mother giggled at the girl's direct but wholly accurate assessment. The father's face began to redden briefly before he too began to laugh. His daughter was right. He thought it was right about art. The couple embraced and drank a great deal of wine, as the French are wont to do, and Marie had some wine as well, though hers was diluted with water from the pump. She sucked it up using licorice as a straw. Verse 2. The parents, inspired by Marie's spot-on critique, briefly renewed their efforts to get their daughter to create art, but it quickly became clear that these efforts were no less futile than they had always been. This did not particularly disappoint the parents, though, as they were very proud indeed of the girls' knack for criticism. In fact, they came to rely heavily upon it regarding their own works, and the quality of which improved markedly in the face of such unforgiving assessment. It wasn't long before the couple told their friends about the young girl, girl's talent. Many of these friends were themselves artists, of course, and such types tend to hang out together, and many of these friends, incredulous of the couple's claims, took it upon themselves to visit with an artwork or two in hand. Each, in turn, would unveil the creation, ask Murray what she thought of it, and leave with their incredulity transformed into conviction. There were, needless to say, a few artists who did not appreciate a blunt dismissal of their work. One friend, who left the house, a friend no longer, upon presenting his work, was told by Marie, This piece is really, really bad. It genuinely hurts my eyes to look upon it, and I entreat you, sir to cover it up post-haste, or to return home with it, and study it as a catalogue of mistakes to avoid. After a stunned silence, punctuated only by an incompletely smothered snicker from the direction of Marie's mother, the gentleman spoke stiffly and with a sneer. It's that girl's slanted eyes. They make her unfit to discern true artistic grace. I always knew there was something not right with this girl. Her skin, for God's sake, is the color of dung, and I assure you no respectable artist will ever care which what she thinks. This gentleman was chased from the home by Marie's father, who held an iron skillet aloft as he ran, apparently intended to use said cookware to pound the man's manners back into him. Happily for all involved, Marie's father smoked heavily and was unable to maintain the chase even as far as the wooden fence across the yard where the gentleman had tied his horse. Despite this unseemliness, it never occurred to the couple to suggest that Marie to Marie that she couched her critiques in more politic language. Instead, they began to warn any who wished to hear her opinion that it might be very harsh, and the father used the story of the spiteful gentleman to drive the warning home. By the time Marie reached her tenth year, a steady stream of local artists passed through the country house, seeking guidance from the girl. She always provided it when asked, and she never offered any opinion when she was not asked. Also, it became clear by this time that her talent transcended medium. She was equally accurate about long fiction as she was about painting and sculpting. In one neighboring village, metered verse was all the rage. When the artist brought their work to be viewed, she was perfectly correct in her assessment of that as well. And many years later, when music would return to the world, she would prove just as certain and correct regarding that. When not judging art, however, Maria was an ordinary girl. She read no better or faster than her same age peers, nor had she gotten any greater or lesser interest in books. She enjoyed playing the run and hide games of children, and she loved the starchy foods of her parents' kitchen. She was well-liked and was a good, but not remarkably good, student. When asked to judge art, however, it was as though she became a different person. A novelist, for example, brought a rather expansive and dense piece of historical fiction and asked Marie for her opinion of the work. The girl sat at her kitchen table and read the entire book in 20 minutes, then proceeded to give a detailed critique of the character, narrative, arc, plot, and voice. When she finished with a larger aesthetic issue, she cataloged over 300 typos and punctuation errors, citing the page numbers and paragraphs from memory. 
The dumbfounded novelist simply listened amazed. When Marie finished speaking, the novelist asked her to repeat the catalog that he might write it down for reference, but Marie either could not or would not. She simply didn't respond at all to the novelist's requests. This writer, the writer discussed this fact with her parents, and it was proposed as an experiment that he would ask her again when he arrived what she thought of the work as a whole. Again, this elicited absolutely no response. And thus was it determined that Marie evaluated a given work once and only once. Two more years passed until just before Marie's 13th birthday, the girls' parents found themselves devoting nearly all of their time to supporting Marie's talent. Their house had become a very high-traffic destination, as artists from all over France came to seek the girls' counsel. Had Marie never even ex ever expressed the smallest resentment of the burden that this placed upon her, of course her parents would have immediately curtailed the procession of creators. But Marie, when asked about the long hours, simply said, let them all come. Her enthusiastic endorsement of an artwork had come to mean success for the rare artist so deserving. Even a generally positive review sometimes meant legitimacy. Most evaluations were negative, but almost all contained useful advice. Only real crap was dismissed with little or no explanation. And because every evaluation was specific to the work in question, an artist could return with a new work and new hope. Similarly, though, a glowing review of one artist's works was by no means an assurance that another work by the same artist would be well received. Marie's parents were tired of all the people, but they were happy for their daughter, who had become something of a celebrity, and they resolved to endure the routine for her sake. On the day of her 13th birthday, however, all that changed. Marie awoke and dressed. She walked into the kitchen, tore a hunk of bread from the loaf, and purred, purred, and poured milk, fresh milk into a cup. Mother, father, today I become the beholder, so I must leave this home now, for there are things I, that I must do. However, I love you both very dearly, so I shall not go far from here, and you shall see me sometimes. Do not despair that I am going, for my departure will allow you to each to return to your own creative endeavors, which are important, and which you have been neglecting on my behalf and on behalf of your fellow artists. I am going now, and I am going to take this cup with me, and this bread, of course. But don't worry, as I will return the cup to you within a week or two. And with that, she hugged her mother, and then her hugged her father, and kissed him on the cheek, and then picked up her bread and cup of milk and walked out the door. Her parents, stunned by this turn of events, looked at one another for a second. But your presents, it's your birthday, said the father, turning back towards the door. Both parents then rushed out after their daughter. She was nowhere to be seen. Verse 3 True to her word, the beholder did not travel far from her home. Just outside of her village was a large hill. The hill was covered in grasses and such, as hills almost always are, but just beneath the topsoil, this hill was solid granite. And on the afternoon of the beholder's 13th birthday, every person in the village heard a great rumbling coming from the hill. The sound became so loud that everyone went outside to see what all the groaning and earth shaking was about. And the villagers, each of them, looked to the west where stood the hill and saw a great granite sphere shaking off all the dirt and grass that had previously clung to it. This sphere sat atop a mighty pedestal also of granite, and slowly the pedestal shook from it bits of granite until the shape of a long set of stone stairs took form. Then at the base of the sphere, just above the pedestal, a rectangular hole opened the size and shape of a very large doorway, and from out that hole tumbled out a vast amount of granite dust and chunks. These made their way to the bottom of the stairs and were shaken off the stairs until at last the rumbling stopped. When the dust cleared, the villagers looked upon a flawless stone sphere, larger by far, than any of the homes in the villages, than all of the homes of the village combined, larger by far, in fact, than the hill itself had been, as the whole thing had risen up and taken up a substantial part of its mass from the bedrock below, and leading up to that sphere was a perfect and very long set of granite stairs. As the villagers watched, the beholder climbed those stairs and entered the sphere through the rectangular hole at its base. After she entered, a slab which until that moment had been hidden from view slid down from the top of the rectangular hole and sealed it so completely and so seamlessly that none could see any indication whatsoever of where the hole had been. That night there was a terrible storm. It was by far the worst storm that anyone in the village could ever remember. It was marked most notably by an extraordinary amount of lightning, and it seemed as though at least every third or fourth bolt struck the great granite sphere. As the winds increased and the rain poured down in torrents, all of the villagers returned to the warmth and safety of their homes. Only two people remained in the street, watching the sphere and worrying helplessly for their daughter. So only two people actually saw the final lightning strike that broke from the perfect spear, a single great piece of rock. But every villager awoke to a clear cold morning and saw what the spear had become. Looming over their quiet village was a massive eye cast by the heavens in cold granite. Verse 4. 
It was fairly obvious to even the most slow-witted of the villagers that Marie was no longer Marie. Beholder had arrived, and the massive stone church that she had raised ensured that this arrival did not stay secret. Like any god, she soon attracted a priesthood, which took up residence inside the eye, with her holy patron, Beholder. And this priesthood attended to the many bureaucratic doings, schedulings, and record-keepings and such that we now expect from the Church of the Beholder. This priesthood eventually established the efficient system by which the works are now submitted for beholdens, and by which her holy judgments are rendered and delivered. We Cursarians, incidentally, have an active and good working relationship with the Beholdarians, and consider them allies and friends, and I must say that we are consistently impressed with the quick turnaround time and high level of professionalism achieved by the Beholders' clergy. As this very work that you, dear reader, currently peruse, shall no doubt eventually make its way to the eye, I'll beg your patience and indulge in a brief thank you to whichever noble Beholderian prince, to whichever noble Beholderian priest should happen to glance upon this manuscript before it reaches the eyes of Her Holiness. But it must be admitted that during the early days of her church, when this system had not yet been refined, it often took months or even years for a submitted work to receive the Beholder's holy and true judgment. This is of note as it gave rise to a strange idiom that is often the source of confusion among faithful Panthonians, Pantheonians who do not know the story of its origins. In those early days, an artist, upon submitting his art to the great eye, would wait and wait to hear a response from the Beholdarian clergy. This artist's friends and associates naturally would tend to query the artist about his work. Well, have you heard? Is your work good? Have you achieved beauty? This phenomenon became so common, in fact, that the response evolved into idiom. Beauty, the artist would say, is in the eye of the beholder. Thus did this phrase come to mean, no one knows yet for sure whether it is good or not, because the beholder hasn't finished evaluating it. Around the same time, however, there came into being a cult of bitter artists. It was made up of artists who refused to accept the beholder's true but deflating dismissal of their artwork, and the cult took a particular liking to this idiom, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, because the saying seemed generally insulting to the beholder and a church, or at least to the efficiency of said parties. Unsatisfied by this petty insult, however, these bitter souls twisted the meaning of the idiom over time. Eventually, they used the words to indicate there is no definitive quality in art, or that everyone's opinion is equal about art. For some reason, this is the meaning that stuck, and many still interpret it thusly today. Granted, few outside the cult will ever have cause to utter the phrase, but still. The group those angry artists began is today known as the cult of aesthetic relativism. Its adherents are, of course, pitied by almost everyone as they have embraced a notion that is so obviously untrue that it warrants no discussion at all. Which smacks of a clean end ending to this chapter of Gospel, but before I conclude the history of the ascendancy of the Beholder, I must yet tie up one last narrative string. The Beholder was true to her promise to her parents. Within a fortnight of ascension, she descended from the eye to return the milk cup. It was a Sunday. She arrived around 5 p.m. and stayed the evening and ate dinner with her mother and father. And they were so gladdened to see her and she to see them that when she left last around 9 p.m., she took with her a cup of milk so that she would need to return the cup the following Sunday. And this was her habit every week for many, many years until at last her parents both died after one such visit on a Sunday night at 10 p.m. in bed together of no causes at all other than it was time to go.